Did he make a difference in your life when he passed by? Amen. Let's go to 216 in your hymnal. 216. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Let's all stand together as we sing. 216. Beulah land on that first. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. singing tonight. Good to see you in church this evening. Hope you had a good afternoon. I uh, had a good service this morning, didn't we? And uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us tonight. Thanks for being back in church on Sunday evening. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer tonight. We ask you to come and meet with us this evening. Uh, thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts this morning and for decisions that were made for you today. Lord, thank you for bringing folks back to church on Sunday night. Lord, I pray your blessing on the music and our fellowship together. And once again, Lord, please use and honor the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, use it in each one of our hearts and lives and, and make us more like Christ because we were here this evening. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Amen. Let's go to 137 in your hymnal. 137. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. 137. Let's sing that first together. 
Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and sing, and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. On that last hymn, rose the world with truth and grace. And makes a nation prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. All right. Regular schedule this week now, ladies. Tomorrow night will be your ladies' night out. Remember that, 6 o'clock uh, over in the Fellowship Hall. You're going to have a great time together, and uh, it's not too late. If you haven't signed up, please do so this evening, and uh, uh, don't forget your white elephant gift for tomorrow night. You're going to have a great time. Then um, if you haven't got your tickets yet for the adult Christmas banquet out at Dear Dutchman, you make sure you see Carol Coleman, or your reservation, rather. We're not giving you a ticket or anything, but just... Uh, Make sure you get your name down for her. We have to give them a count by Wednesday night, and uh, we we want you to help. If you, if you absolutely just financial financial is your only reason, then make sure you see Carol, okay? We've had some folks who have given extra money, and uh, they are willing to help someone who might not be otherwise be able to go, and uh, so take advantage of that, all right? That's a blessing, and uh, we're glad to have as many folks there who, who would like to be there. Um, Wednesday night, midweek service, 7 o'clock, right back here in the auditorium, continuing our spiritual warfare and uh, the armor of God, and uh, one more piece of armor that goes over everything, and you're going to find that out Wednesday night, okay? So don't miss that. Wednesday evening, the children's clubs will be meeting as usual, and then uh, remember, next Sunday evening at 545 will be the children's uh, Christmas play, and I uh, want to make sure you make note of that, 545 for that time, and then when they're done, we'll just have a brief break and go right into our evening service, okay? And uh, that'll be great. On the 18th of December at 6 o'clock, the choir will present their cantata for Christmas, and uh, that is called The Hope of Christmas, and uh, cantata and uh, drama presentation as well, and uh, it was, it's, a, it's, it's a great, great message, so you're going to look forward to that. That's on the 18th. All right, and I think that's all I've got right now. Let's take a moment and welcome any guests we have with us in the service. Anybody here tonight for the very first time? I think there's a white-haired lady back here. We don't. Oh, that's Sally Spargro. There we go. Welcome, Sally. Good to see you. Wow. I, last I heard, you were in Tennessee, and you just weren't going to get here in time, but you got here in time. Amen. Good to see you tonight. Praise the Lord. Glad you made it in. That's wonderful. All right, let's hear from the choir.
888 488. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord a new name and glory. 488. We're going to sing all three stanzas on that first. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white road angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I sins forgiven I am bound for heaven never more to roam in the book is written saved by grace all the joy that came to my soul now I am forgiven and I know by the blood I am made whole for there's a new name written down in glory Great singing this morning, this evening. 136. Let's go to 136. There's a song in the air. There's a star in the sky. 136. Would you stand with me as we, as we sing? <clears throat> Let's sing that first together. There's a song in the air. There's a star in the sky. There's a mother's deep prayer and a baby's low cry and the star ranges far while the beautiful sing for the manger of bethlehem cradles the king there's a tumult of joy or the wonderful birth or the virgin sweet boy is the Lord of the earth. I, the star reigns its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king. Amen. Great one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing those last stanzas together.
in the light of that star lies the ages impelled and that song from afar has swept over the world every hearth is a flame and the beauty for sing in the homes of the nations that Jesus is King. Let's sing that last together as you find your seats. We rejoice in the light and we echo the song. We rejoice in the light and we echo the song that comes down through the night from that heavenly throng. I we shout to the lovely evangel they bring, and we greet in his cradle our Savior and King. Do you want to do that verse? That verse? All right, that last one. We rejoice in the light, and we echo the song that comes down through the night from the heavenly throng. I we shout to the lovely evangel they bring, and we greet in his cradle. You may be seated. Ushers will come and we'll get our offering now this evening. Give as God has blessed and prospered you. Remember the 18th of December will be our special Christmas offering. And uh, I'll have something in the bulletin about that next Sunday as well. So you uh, know exactly what we're going to try to get with that offering. And uh, let's just be praying about what the Lord would have you to do. All right. Let's ask God's blessing and offering tonight. Our brother Rawlis lead us in our prayer. Father, what a good day it has been in your house, and Lord, we so look forward to hearing from your word tonight, and Lord, uh, Lord, take control of each and every one of us, and help us to learn from your word. Lord, there's a purpose that we might uh, do those works which we read about and we study, and, and Lord, we want to so much uh, serve you. It's such a privilege, and Father... Uh, we know that there's not anything any good that comes out of us unless it's uh, built upon the, the firm foundation of Christ Jesus. Father, bless the offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your Bible this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you would please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for our scripture reading tonight. 
And we are going to read verses 9 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3 and verses 9 through 15. We'll begin together on verse 9, and I'll read 10. We'll read it alternately like we usually do till we end together on verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 9. Ready? For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the Scripture here tonight. And Lord, we thank you again for the Bible and for preserving your word for us that we hold copies of it in our hands tonight. Lord, how valuable that is to us and how important it is to each one of our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would make our hearts good ground tonight, that the Word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. Father, bless the special now, and Lord, may we listen carefully, and may you use it to help us to put our hearts in tune with yours. In Jesus' name, amen. What though the way be lonely? And dark the shadows fall I know where'er it leadeth My Father planned it all I sing through the shade and the sunshine I'll trust Him whatever befall I sing for I cannot be silent My Father planned it all there may be sunshine tomorrow, shadows may break and flee. Twill be the way he chooses, my father's plan for me. I sing through the shade and the sunshine, I'll trust him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent. My father planned it all. He guides my faltering footsteps along the weary way. For well he knows my pathway will lead to endless day. A day of light and gladness on which no shade will fall. Tis this at last awaits me. My Father planned it all. I sing through the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust Him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent. My Father planned it all. That's good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you again tonight, Lord, for the opportunity to open up your word together. And I'm, Lord, I'm asking for your help as we come to the preaching of your word tonight. Help me as I bring this truth this evening. And please help each one to listen. Give us all ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church tonight. And, Lord, may we grasp the truth as we see it 
uh, here in this passage and throughout the scripture. And I pray it would be a, a help and an encouragement to each of us tonight. And so Lord, guide us and lead us through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. In writing to the church of Corinth, most of you know the church of Corinth would not be the model church. Okay, uh, It was a very troubled church, a very problematic church. If you just look at the sheer volume of words that it took to deal with this church, when you realize that every uh, you have a first epistle or first letter to the church of Corinth that is 16 chapters long, you have a second letter, a follow-up letter, if you will, that is 13 more chapters long. That's 29 chapters uh, addressed to one church. You go to the churches of Galatia. That were many churches in the region of Galatia. Six chapters to all those churches. Uh, you have Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, six chapters. You have the church in Philippi, just four chapters. Uh, you have the church in Colossae, just four chapters. So just uh, not, not as many to all those churches as it was just to this one church. Now they were uh, a troubled church. They were an immature church. They had uh, factions in the church of who they wanted to follow and who they wanted to uh, be a part of. And, and so Paul is addressing something here in 1 Corinthians 3, if your Bible's still open there. He's addressing them about the judgment seat of Christ. All right? There are two judgments that are going to take place. There's a judgment of lost people, those who do not know Christ as their Savior. That is called the great white throne judgment. All right? That is in Revelation chapter 20. Believers will not be judged at the great white throne judgment. I believe, I do believe we will see that judgment. I think we'll hear that judgment. We, 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 I don't know whether people there will see us or not, but I think we'll see them. Uh, we're not part of that judgment. That's simply a judgment on the lost. This judgment that he speaks of here in 1 Corinthians 3 is called the judgment seat of Christ. And every believer will appear here. No lost people will appear here. Only saved people will appear here. All right? And he's writing to them and he says, and the reason we know that is this. The Bible says here that uh, Paul said, notice that in verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Because other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we know that everybody who's at this judgment has built something on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Once you got saved, whether you realized it or not, whether you comprehended it or not, Jesus Christ became the foundation of your life. And now, since that day, you're building a building you're building something on top of that foundation. Now, God says here, the material that you use to build is two different kinds of material. Verse 12, If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, there's the first three ingredients, or it could be wood, hay, and stubble. All right? Now, if you're going to build, would you rather build with gold, silver, and precious stones? Or, or would you rather build with wood, hay, and stubble? Okay? All you have to know is the story of three pigs to figure that one out. All right? And uh, you got it down. So, so you know that you want to build with the gold, silver, and the precious stones. Because, and by the way, especially so when you find out verse 13. Every man's work will be made manifest, made known, for the day shall declare it, because it will be revealed by what, church? Fire. The fire will try every man's work. Now notice, of what sort it is. It's going to try everybody's work, not of what amount it is, not of how great it is, but of what sort it is. In other words, here, the, the, the test at the judgment seat with the fire is not just about what we've done, but it is also about why we've done it. Motives do matter. And we're going to find that out. In fact, look in chapter 4. I don't have to turn a page in my Bible. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But chapter 4 and verse 5. 
Paul says, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, now notice this, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. So when God says at the judgment seat, what He's going to do is He's going to make manifest. Make manifest means it'll be made known what the counsel of our heart was. And your heart is why, not just what we did, but the motive behind what we did. Now the question becomes this. What is the proper motive for serving God? Uh, Jesus condemned the Pharisee not, by the way, not necessarily for what they did. He didn't condemn them for praying. He condemned them for praying to be seen of men. He condemned them not for fasting because He told us we should fast. But He condemned them for fasting and appearing unto men to fast. In other words, they did what they did because they wanted everybody to see them. They wanted everybody. And God said, when you do it for the applause of men or you do it for the praise of man, you have your reward. In other words, you're not, if they appear, if they appear at the judgment seat, their work would be burnt by fire. Because their, their counsel of their heart, their motive of their heart was simply the applause of men. Now Jesus, it's important to note, did not condemn them for praying, or for fasting, or for giving. But he condemned them for their motive and why they were doing it. Now listen carefully. Then what is the best motive for serving God? Somebody says, well, it must be love. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I, I would not argue that. I think that's, that's, that's a very good motive. And we ought to do the love. Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. Somebody else says, well, it's, it's to please God. Because Revelation 4.11 says we were created for His pleasure. Would someone turn this on for me, please? We were created for His pleasure. And so whatever we do, we should do it for His pleasure. In other words, I'm not, I'm not trying to do what I do for my pleasure. I'm trying to do it for God's pleasure. I'm trying to do it because I know He'll be pleased with it. All right? But I would submit to you that I believe what the Bible says, the purpose and the highest motive the best motive that we have to serve God is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you look there for a moment, please? 1 Corinthians 10. A familiar verse to many of you in the room tonight, but I want you to see this truth this evening. Most of you could quote it by heart if I started it. It says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So whether I eat or drink, whatsoever I do, that's all-encompassing, I should do all for the what? Glory of God. Why should you serve God? For His glory, for the glory of God. Why, why should we teach Sunday school? For the glory of God. Why should we sing in the choir? For the glory of God. Why should we play an instrument? For the glory of God. Why should we serve God? For the glory of God. That is the highest and, and, and the best motive that you and I could ever have. Why should a person get saved? Because it brings glory to God when somebody gets saved. Why should I follow the Lord in baptism after salvation? Because it brings glory to God when I obey Him and I follow Him in believer's baptism. And that's why I serve in the church. That You serve in the church, you follow God, you obey His command, not to put the spotlight on you, but to put the spotlight on God and what God can do in a person's life who's yielded to Him. To bring glory to somebody means you, you put the light on them. And so often, uh, we, we want the light on us. And we stand up and say, I, I did this, and I did that, and I do this, and I'm active in this, and, I'm and it's I, 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 I. And it's not supposed to, not about I. Not I, but Christ. He must increase and I must decrease. It's all about the glory of God. I, I, I don't want people to come to church and leave saying, what a wonderful pastor. I want them to leave saying, what a wonderful Savior. You don't want them to come and leave saying, what a wonderful singer. You want to leave saying, what a wonderful Savior. You don't want them to leave saying, what a wonderful usher. You want them to leave saying, what a wonderful Savior. 
It's not about you and it's not about me. It is about Jesus Christ. And we're to do it for His glory. That's ideal. That is the best motive you can ever have in serving God. Now, We'll have confession. That is a Baptist church on the sign out there. We're a Baptist church, but here's confession, okay? I do not always attain that ideal motivation. And before you gasp with, with unbelief, you don't either. Okay? You don't either. I wonder how many of you came to church tonight because you thought, you know what? I'll glorify God if I'm at church tonight. No. The truth is, uh, many, many came because it's Sunday night and we go to church. Sunrise East sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, it's Sunday night, we go to church. And we just do it, out of habit, out of what we know is right to do. Maybe some of you came tonight, younger ones, you came because mom and dad said you're going to church. And if it was up to you, you'd still be at home. But you came because mom and dad said it's church, we're going. And you're going, and so you did. Now listen carefully. Here's going to be the, I'm, I'm, I'm talking tonight, that we got through the introduction almost now, and it's, it's a short sermon, it's not a long sermon. The, trust me, and um, <laughs> the, you've heard it said, well if you're not here because you love Jesus, you might as well go home. Or, if you're not giving cheerfully or because you love the Lord, you might as well not give. Or if you're not going soul winning because you're burdened for the lost, then you might as well not go witness. Now can I tell you something? That's crazy. Okay? If you, if you came to church tonight for any other reason, any other reason, other than the glory of God, I still think you ought to come to church. I still think you ought to be in church. If you serve God for any other reason other than the glory of God, I still think you ought to serve God. I still believe you ought to do what, what you know is right to do, whether it's sing, teach, usher, work in the nursery, help on a bus route, take care of children's church. Uh, the ultimate ideal is I want to do it for God's glory, but if I'm doing it for some other reason, I still ought to do it. Now let me give you three statements, okay, before you get mad at me and think I'm a heretic, okay? Three statements to remember. Number one is this. Two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. You may give, but you give with a wrong motive. Does that mean I should still give? The answer is yes. Because by doing that, I'm only doing one thing wrong, not two. I'm not only not giving, if I, if I don't give, I'm not giving, that's wrong, and I don't have the right motive, that's a second wrong. How can that be right? At least, if I don't have the right motive, I'm still doing the right thing, and I'm at least only half wrong. And I'm closer to being all right than I am if I'm all wrong. Does that make sense? I want to I wanna give, and that's right. Now, I did it with the wrong motive, that's wrong. But if I have the wrong motive and I still don't give, that's two wrongs. And two wrongs never make it right. So I can go to church because it's comfortable, or I can go to church because it's friendly. I can go to church because of a, somebody may go to church because of a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And that's, you say, well, that's wrong. Yeah, but I'm glad they're at church. I'm glad they're still under the sound of the gospel. If I stay home, if we tell them to stay home, we're telling them to do two wrongs. Don't have the right motive and don't do what's right either. You see? Then I'm saying, well, two wrongs will make it right. No, two wrongs never make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Let me give you statement number two. I only have 33 statements, so we're almost, we'll be through quickly. No, I don't have that many. Number two, though you don't have the best motive, you still have a motive to do what's right. Years ago, had a lady come to me and say, I'm a Sunday school teacher and I keep the standards of a teacher. But pastor, she said, I only do it so I can teach. It's not in my heart. I should probably quit my class because I'm not keeping the teaching standards in my heart. And I told her that 
I don't think she ought to resign and she ought to quit her class because she may be taking away the, the one thing that is keeping her from returning to the world and having her go away from God. It's not the best reason, but it's a reason. And she didn't listen. She quit. And surely in a few months she was out of church and eventually not only lost her church, she lost her family as well. It's a tragic thing. Think about, think about Abraham and Lot. Genesis chapter 13. There became a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot and, and, and Abraham came and said, it's not right, we're not going to have any arguing with each other here. And you choose which way you want to go. Now, now, when Lot left Abraham, where did he go? Where did he go? Yeah, pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now, we know that eventually through the progression, he just pitched his tent toward Sodom, but pretty soon, it's not very long until he's living in Sodom. And then we find out he's not just living in Sodom, but he is in the gate of Sodom. That's where leadership is. Now, he's one of the leaders in the community. And, and, and he is full blown into all, all the wrong things. So much so when judgment comes on Sodom and he's told to get out, he can't even get anybody to come out with him. He goes to his daughters and his sons-in-laws who are married. I, I, I believe he had the two daughters at home. I believe Lot and his wife. I believe he had three daughters who were all married and that was six more. And six and four equals ten. Abraham had prayed for ten righteous. I, I think that's what he had. I think he figured Lot will get his family out. But he went to those sons-in-laws and he just seemed as somebody who mocked at them. They, they just made fun of him. Oh man, when did you get religious? Since when do you believe God? Since when do you talk about judgment? Hmm? It, it had nothing to do with it. And so he lost everything. Lost his testimony. Lost his wife as she looked back. Lost his two daughters. And it was, what a mess. I wonder if Lot ever, I wonder if Lot ever thought, boy, I think I should have stayed with Abraham. Sure had it good back there. <laughs> Man, God was blessing me and I had all kinds of good things. I should have just stuck with Uncle Abe. I should have just stayed put. You see, as long as he was with Abraham, he was okay and God prospered him. Now that may not have been the best reason to stay, but it would have been a reason. And his family would have turned out differently. The history would have been different. And so listen, listen, until God works in your heart to get you to the best motive, the glory of God, then use any motive that will keep you doing the right thing. Use any motive that will keep you doing the right thing. A parent says, my children only come because I make them. All right? Let me ask you a question. How many of you grew up in a home where your parents made you go to church with them? Let me see your hand. Okay. How many of you in church tonight because you wanted to be? Look at that. So don't, don't believe the lie that, well, you make them go when they're young. When they get older, they won't want to go. You just saw a bunch of hands that said, I was made when I was younger and I still, and I, I'm old now and I could make my choice. I still want to go. Don't believe that lie. You make it's right to make them go. And at some point along the way, you know what happens? God begins to deal in their heart. And God begins to work in their life. And you don't know what it'll be. You don't know who it'll be. You don't know what, it'll, what, what God will use in their life, but it'll touch their heart. And they'll say, you know what? I want to go to church. I want to do what God wants me to do with my life. Pray as they come, the Word of God will lodge in their heart, and one day they'll want to serve God and bring glory to God with their life. That's what you pray. As you help them, and literally, parents at times, make them do the right thing. You don't, you don't, you don't do that with your kid at home, do you? You don't tell your child, yeah, clean that mess up. <clears throat> I want to. Hey, don't talk back to me. Clean that up right now. Well, if you don't have the right attitude, don't even clean it up. Huh? You don't do that with your kids, do you? Huh? 
And you say, you stomp your feet if you want, spit if you want, make a frowny face if you want, have a poochy lip disease if you want, but you're cleaning it up. You're going to do what I told you to do. And you'll work on the attitude as it comes. So I'd rather do right with a wrong motive than do nothing with a wrong motive. Or do wrong and have a wrong motive. So we said, first of all, two wrongs don't make a right. We said, though you don't have the best motive, you still have a motive to do right. And then number three is this. Doing right with a wrong motive means that I'm only one step away from doing right with a right motive. I may be doing right with a wrong motive, but I'm only one step away from doing right with a right motive. See, there's three places you can be. Number one, you can be doing wrong with a wrong motive. Number two, you can do right with a wrong motive. Or number three, you can do right with a right motive. Most of you probably came to church for some other reason tonight but I'm glad you came to church. In fact, most of you would probably testify there's times you've come to church and, and it really was just out of duty. You didn't feel like it. You maybe had a rough day. You maybe had a, something, something bad happen and, and, and you just didn't feel like coming at all, but you made yourself come. You drug yourself in here. Somebody says, how you doing? Ah, I don't know. But you came to church. But, but it's just that service that God did something in your heart. You left, you left a whole lot different than when you came in. See? Because God worked on you while you were here. Sometimes, don't, don't ever look at people. Listen, church. Don't ever look at people and say, well, I don't think they're here for the right reason. Why is that a concern for you? You know what? They're here. And what I need to pray is, God, minister to their heart while they're here. How can they come when I know this about them or I know that about them? Well, thank, be thankful they don't know everything about you. Okay? Every one of us should be at the altar. That's not our department. That's God's department. You and I don't know anybody else's heart. And I know, I know sometimes we like to look at people and say, yeah, I know what they're thinking or I know what they're doing. No, you don't. No, you don't. You, you, have, you have no idea. Only God makes the counsels of our heart known. In fact, sometimes we don't even know our own heart. Only God does. Only God does. So when they come to church, no matter what the reason is, they're still here. They're still hearing the preaching. They're still uh, hearing the songs that are being sung. They're hearing about having the right motive and honoring God and glorifying God with their life. Hey, they're around other people that have the right motive. They're around some other people that want to give God glory with their life and they want to put a, put a the spotlight on God, not on themselves. And it's that much easier to take the next step because at least I'm here and I'm doing the right thing. That's why you keep coming whether you have the right motive or not. That's why you keep on witnessing and going out soul winning, whether you have the right motive or not. That's why you, you keep serving and you keep singing and you keep teaching, whether you have the right motive or not, because you're only one step away from God putting you right back in the right motive. Listen, we all, we all have peaks and valleys. Nobody, nobody's up all the time. Okay? I, I, I know you don't hear that very often, maybe from preachers. But there's peaks and valleys. Why do you think Paul told Timothy, Timothy, be instant in season and out of season? You know what out of season is? When you don't feel like doing it. Played sports going through high school and, and, uh, and basketball particularly and baseball. But in basketball, they always... Uh, the, the saying was always this. Basketball players are made in the summer and polished in the winter. In other words, all you're doing in wintertime is polishing what you developed in the off-season. 
You know when it was you know when it was hard to play basketball? June, July, and August. Because it's out of season. And you're trying to play basketball through those summer months when it's ninety degrees and the humidity is a hundred and eighty percent. And you don't feel like being out there shooting 400 shots a day. You don't feel like putting the, uh, back, back in the day they had uh, spats. Remember those things? You put them on your ankles, they were weights, and you would run with those. Build up your leg muscles. You do that through the winter time. What were you trying to do? Make yourself in the off season so you'd be better when it's in season. Never had any problem playing basketball when it's basketball season. Hard part was when it was summertime and nobody wanted to be out there. You see? In season, out season. But listen, you have in seasons and out of seasons in your Christian life. Now, will you be honest with me tonight? You're in church. How many of you will be honest enough to say there's morning, there are mornings when you get up and you get up and read your Bible, but you don't feel like getting up and reading your Bible? Is there anybody be honest enough to admit that? Yeah. There's times, it, whatever the circumstance may be, that you just feel like, Snooze looks pretty good. Fifteen more minutes is inviting. But you know what? You didn't. You, you shut it off, grabbed yourself, and said, get out of bed. It's time to, time to open the Bible up and read it. And you know what? You sat down without the right motive. But by the time you read for a few minutes, and God began to speak to your heart, things changed. And you, you left the quiet time differently than when you came into the quiet time. See? Because you did right with a wrong motive and God brought your motive around. You know where God works? God always works on our heart. And God is the one who can give us the right motive. And so serve Him when the motive is right and best and serve Him when I know the motive is not right. But I'm going to keep serving Him. That's really what, what Christians, what successful Christians learn to do is they learn to just keep on serving. The ones who are up and down and up and down and in and out, you know what they do? When they don't feel like doing it, they don't come. When they don't feel like doing it anymore, they quit their place of service. The ones you've seen serve God and they've been serving God for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, I'll tell you what they did. They kept serving when they didn't feel like serving. They kept serving even at times when their motive wasn't quite what it should have been. But they didn't, they weren't going to let two wrongs make a right. And they knew that if I could serve and I can go through even with the wrong motive, God will bring that motive around to where my heart will be right. And I'll get to serve Him with the right motive. God will warm my heart and I'll come around to the right motive again. You see, you got saved that way. Honestly, there's nobody in this room, I don't think, that would, I, I've never heard a testimony, Brother Jarvis, where somebody said, well, I just really got convicted that I wasn't giving God glory with my life, and so I accepted Jesus as my Savior. No. You know why most people got saved? Why did you get saved? Because you, you, you found out you were going to bust hell wide open. You found out I'm going to die and go to hell if I don't get saved. I'm gonna, I, I, I've got no hope here. And, and what's the way out? What's the only way I won't die and go to hell? I have to accept Jesus as my Savior. He died on the cross for my sins. Okay, I'm going to get saved. Now, that's not the ideal motive, according to the Bible. You're supposed to get saved for the glory of God. Because in the flesh, you can't bring glory to God. And that's why we were created. Now, let me ask you a question. Since you've been saved, you didn't get saved for the right motive, but since you've been saved, now you don't have the attitude, hey man, I'm not going to hell, that's all that matters. Oh no. No. You, now, you want to live for God. You want to live a life that brings glory to Him. How'd you get there? Huh? God, brought your, God brought your motive around to the right motive. You know what? Aren't you glad somebody was patient enough with you? Hmm? And let you grow, let God work in your life to where He could bring you to the right motive? There are times, listen, as a church grows and more people come in, 
People come in for all different kinds of reasons. People keep coming for different reasons. You know what you do? Be glad they're coming. Be glad they're here. And just ask God to continue to work in their life and work in their heart. And listen, let's make sure that our motive is what it ought to be. And that, that, that if, they, if they decide to look at us as an example, they'll have a good example to follow. And we're going to do, uh, but in God's sight and with God's help, to do everything we can to live for the glory of God and to live for His honor. Whether therefore I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, I want to do all to the glory of God. That's the best motive. But until I get there, I'll use a good motive until God can give me the best motive. So when you feel yourself getting into an out-of-season situation and you feel like your motive isn't quite what it should be, just ask God to help you do what's right. And please, God, bring me from the wrong motive or maybe the good motive to the best motive. And bring, that, bring my heart around again to what it ought to be. And God will do that. And then I think when you're tried by fire, it'll be the gold and the silver, and the precious stone. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth tonight and it will help us. I pray, Lord, that we would all be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know that our labor is never in vain in the Lord. Lord, I believe tonight that so often we We've hit on these things and we, we don't really think them through. And Father, I pray you'd help us to be faithful to you, faithful in our service for you. The Lord, each of us would have a desire in our heart that we would do it to bring glory to you, that we would put you in a good light because of how we live our lives. I think Jesus said in Matthew 5, Lord, that we should let our light so shine before men, they'll see our good works and they'll glorify our Father which is in heaven. They'll put the spotlight on you. That's, that's what we ultimately want. Now, Lord, I pray you'd help some folks here tonight who maybe they realize that's, that's not been my best motive. But they tonight would say, I want that to be my best motive. I want that to be my ideal. I'm going to ask God to do that in my heart. Until that happens, I'll keep doing what I know is right to do, even though I may not have the best motive. But a motive is better than no motive at all in doing the wrong thing. So, Lord, I pray the truth has helped somebody tonight. And I pray it will help us collectively as a church as we try to minister and help others to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a minute. We'll have our invitation. I wonder how many folks here this evening and say, Pastor, God has spoken to my heart tonight. Now listen, it may be, it may be you personally saying, I've, I've been struggling because my motive, I don't think, is just for the glory of God. Maybe I've had some other motives, but you know what? Maybe tonight you thank God at least you have a motive, and it's kept you doing the right thing. But you're willing tonight to ask God to bring you to the best motive. That God would work in your heart that you truly would desire to do what you do for Him, for His glory, for His honor that the light would be on him and not on you. Or you might be here tonight and say, Preacher, it, that message helped me understand. And, and, and I, don't want, I don't want to become judgmental of people about why they're here or why they're doing what they're doing. I'm glad if they're here. And I want to be patient and let God bring them around to where they'll have the best motive and the ideal motive for serving him. 
And I wonder if God's spoken to your heart in those ways tonight. Would you slip your hand, slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me this evening. The message helped me tonight. Would you say, pray for me? Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. The Lord has dealt with your heart. Why don't you respond to him tonight? Bow the knee and just, just ask God. Respond to him for whatever he said to you tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. I pray your will will be done now in this invitation time. Lord, I pray that you'd hear our prayer. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to our hearts this evening. Lord, I pray your will will be done in every heart and life, and no one will resist you this evening. Oh, bring us all to the ultimate motive and the best motive, and that is that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we'll do all to the glory of God. Quietly with your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? All to Jesus That's I right. surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. To Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender Father, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be mindful of what we've heard today. Lord, I pray that as we remember Peter, that we would learn to stay close to you, not become self-confident, not to neglect to pray. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to trust you with all our heart, acknowledge you, in all of our ways, and honor you with all that we have. And I pray, Lord, tonight you'd help us to serve you, and to obey you with the best motive of all, and that is to bring glory to you, to put you in a good light. But Lord, and if that's not always the case, and that's not always what we're, we have in our heart, at least help us to do the right thing. And we ask you to work in our heart. And give us a heart that will bring honor and glory to you. Lord, I pray that our goal would be whatever we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we would do all to the glory of God. You would make us that kind of a church. We love you. Thank you for a wonderful day together in the house of God. Dismiss us now with your care. God, make us mindful of your presence with us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you haven't signed up uh, for Emily's shower, I think that's, is that, when is that? A week from Tuesday? The 13th, right? They come home Tuesday, by the way, be praying for John and Emily. They'll be flying from Uganda and, uh, and, and 
baby as well. Can't forget Lydia, and uh, she'll be. They'll be flying in, so please pray for their safety. Uh, they get in Tuesday evening, sometime I think our time, and uh, then. If you haven't signed up, ladies, to go to that shower on the 13th, the sign-up sheet's still down there, okay? Caroling, we're going caroling on December 17th. There's a sign-up sheet for that downstairs, and uh, we'll go at 10 o'clock Saturday, 10 to noon, and uh, come back and have some cookies and hot chocolate and such. So uh, that's always a blessing, always a great time uh, to go caroling on that Saturday, all right? Let's sing, It's a Grand Thing to Be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing. Uh, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>